This is one of my favorite chapters of the David story. Who even knew Abigail existed before? Confession time? All right, okay. She's phenomenal. And when I'm talking with Mike about Abigail, the superhero, he assigns a cape for her in our image this morning because she jumped in. She jumped into a role that was not hers. She jumped into a need that she had not caused. She jumped in to bring a way forward, to bring blessing that wasn't required of her. And without hesitation, she was there to right a wrong that she didn't cause, that she didn't even know was happening. But as soon as she found out about it, she responded. And she responded with a potluck that we will soon get to taste, but whoa, like right, 200 fig cakes, 100 raisin cakes, five sheep ready, 200 loaves of bread. I mean, we had a good time World Communion Sunday, but whoa, Abigail was on it. And that is why I love her for this Stewardship Sunday. Because this is the role, this is the model of giving. Because we give to meet needs, we give to offer blessing, even when it's not our role to do so. Even when the blessing that's needed is needed to come from someone other than us, but we see that someone other than us not providing that blessing. And it's so important to us that blessing be there that we step in to fill the gap. That's what it means to be the church. That's what it means to be present in the midst of lives that are struggling and wrestling and having trouble catching a break because we know the break that Kim and Ross are desperately trying to catch of all they've been through and how they put their faith in God's hands and asked for the strength and they've made it through the treatments and they're doing it and then all of a sudden something else lands in their lap. This is exactly what David is going through. He's been escaping Saul and Saul's spears in the caves. He even came up, I'm sorry, there's a lot of number ones in this story, so just get prepared for using the bathroom occurring in this story a lot. So David comes up on Saul using the bathroom in the very cave that he's hiding in and knows he has the chance right then and there to take Saul out to kill him. But he doesn't. He just takes a piece off his cloak and confronts him later and says, look, I had the chance to kill you, and I didn't. And in that moment, for a brief moment, Saul sees. Like his whole alternative reality that he set up for himself breaks down, and he sees the goodness that he doesn't deserve that David is giving him. And he even in that moment proclaims, no wonder God has made you king. Because if you are able to do this, then you are rightfully king. And if David had killed Saul in that cave in that moment, that confession of Saul, that validation of God's anointing never would have happened. And David did it. Like how many of us can duck spears literally and then be in the very place to make it so that we don't have to duck and hide anymore and still do what David does? And so then David goes on. There are people following him and seeing something, right, of this anointed leadership in him. Except then once again, he's protected this guy's sheep the whole way. They're tr scraping by. And then here comes the moment where the guy can share right? The bounty that he has because of them. And he's like, Psh, no, forget about it. I don't know if you were there. I wasn't there. There are a whole bunch of people laying claim to things that, they, that aren't theirs and shouldn't be. And so how do I know your claim's valid? And uh-uh, nope, I got me in mine. And David's had it, right? That is just one time too far. I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying with all of who I am. And this is one injustice and one moment. And he just cracks. He just breaks. Breaks to the point, right, Aiden, it's pretty terrifying of he is going to kill every single male in Nabal's entire household. That's how strong his anger is. 
Like he is done. But there is a woman named Abigail that has lived her life in such a way that servants are able to trust her and go to her and give her warning about what's happening. And she responds instantly and is there and brings peace to a situation where there was no peace. And that's why we do life together. And that's why we give to churches, to Epworth. That's why we give to the United Methodist Committee on Relief. That's why we give to groups. And that's why we don't do this journey alone. Because there will be too much for us at some chapter of our lives. There will be more than we can handle. And that's why we give. That's why we pool our resources so that when we are in one of those chapters, there's some other Abigail in another chapter who's there who has given to cover the need. Even though it's technically not their responsibility, we are a people who care about God's salvation and God's abundance and God's blessing enough that we trust that we don't have to hoard our own out of fear that we can give to provide for someone else and know then that if we ever find ourselves in a similar chapter, there will be that provision for us as well. And that's why we come to a day like today where we set our pledges, where we look over what is going on in our lives and what we have to work with resource-wise, and we redefine what is enough for us. Because we have in this scripture passage, right, that Nabal had a feast fit for a king, but yet in his definition of enough, there still wasn't enough room to give from that feast fit for a king to provide for anyone else. But yet for Abigail's definition, there was plenty of room, so much that she didn't even have to think about it. She just instantly got those carts loaded up and got them there to the need. And so part of this process is a spiritual discipline for ourselves to let the Holy Spirit redefine for us what is enough for us and to put a spirit of grace within us where there was once fear that we can give trusting that we will have enough as we are able to meet someone else's enough. And that in that moment will be blessing and will be abundance that we don't ever know about or experience if all we do is hoard based on fear. And so we come to a time of giving. And, and please know that we're, we want to be practical here, right? Like we don't want you to give a pledge that is going to break you. That's absolutely the opposite of what we're going for here. And so if you're in a chapter and in a season where you are under siege as David was, then this is a time where you don't pledge as much this coming year. I would still encourage you to pledge something because that's the spiritual discipline of remembering that even as bad as we have it, there is always someone who has it worse and there is always a way for God to bring enough into our lives. So something, yes, everything, no. But there are others of us who are in a very comfortable and a very good season. And so we can take a further risk and a greater giving and increase the percentage of what we give. And we do this not as a one-time gift. I'm sorry, I'm having something trouble in my throat. Excuse me for a moment. <coughs> we give this not as a one-time gift, but as a percentage of our income. So this is the first fruits part. So it's a way that we remember that yes, we worked for this, um, but there's so much more that God did and brought about to put at work that we have the job that we have, that we have the community and the support that we have that honestly doesn't depend upon us as well, at all. That is sheer luck or God coincidence and our communities of support and employment opportunities and other things that other people don't have. Not because they haven't tried or haven't worked for it, but simply because of the brokenness of our world. 
And so we give monthly to remember that what we have is a blessing of God and is not to be hoarded, but is to be shared so that we can become a through channel for that grace, for it to reach others who are hiding in caves, who have just gone as far as they possibly can. We are called to give life. And I have seen that just yesterday and people spending time on a Saturday to bake and bring things in. I have seen that in the, um, uh, what do we call it, the bazaar sale. <laughs> I'm looking at Frida and Jan. Um, that we have been um, making and creating for to come together to then make a way for fun fellowship and gifts and also a way to give back. Um, and to make our ministries possible. I have seen that happen over and over again in terms of the money you give not only to the church and to us as a community to be there in support of each other, but to the pastor's discretionary fund as well. We have, we have saved so many evictions this year, and we have given huge amounts of money that honestly, I have not been a part of at a church community before. It's been a typical 100 or 200 here to make it happen. There are multiple times this year that we have given over $1,000 to make housing happen and be affordable. And that is because you are the Abigails. And that's because you see the need and you respond instantly. And I'm so proud and so grateful to be a part of a community that values that and holds that and shares that. And so as we go into this coming year and this coming pledge, I ask that you keep being the Abigails you have already been and that you keep giving and that we keep working to transform the Nabal fear. Because let's be honest, that fear resides in each and every single one of us and it will until God comes and returns and all is set on earth. But may this discipline of giving be a discipline that enables our souls and our faith to grow so that we can more and more easily be Abigail with less and less of the Nabal temptation within us. And now we are here to celebrate the journey that our confirmands have chosen to take on to be a part of this.